Thank you so much, Hunter and Grace, for sharing your experiences with us. And um, I love your words. Hopefully we can make genetic disorders something we can get over and get through instead of a stop sign in life. For those of you just joining us, I'm Tippi McKenzie. I'm a pediatric surgeon at UCSF. And we are really here today because of the pioneering work of Dr. Michael Harrison, who's by all accounts, the father of fetal surgery. Dr. Harrison is a pediatric surgeon who recognized that many of the anatomic conditions that we see in pediatric surgery are already very severe by the time we meet the baby at birth. And he thought perhaps we can develop operations to treat these patients before birth, especially since we were starting to diagnose them with fetal ultrasound. He is an out of the box thinker and an amazing surgeon. And he devoted his career to developing maternal fetal operations to treat a range of anatomic disorders. And today fetal surgery is practiced all over the world, often by doctors who can trace their connections to Mike. So what is the current repertoire of fetal surgery? Here we have a picture of a myelomeningocele repair, one of the most common, common open fetal surgery operations performed now at multiple centers around the world. A randomized clinical trial showed that fetal repair improved outcomes in children compared to postnatal repair. We also do fetoscopic operations, often for problems in twin pregnancies, and ultrasound guided procedures to drain fluid collections, et cetera. One fetal procedure that's been around even longer than fetal surgery is accessing the umbilical vein to give blood transfusions for a fetus, for example, for RH disease. This is done with ultrasound guidance with a thin, long needle. This procedure is also performed at many centers with an excellent safety profile. So this is our general systemic delivery method for these new fetal molecular therapies that we're developing, such as stem cell transplantation, enzyme replacement therapy, or in the future, gene therapy. Although these therapies are just starting, over time we expect they'll be a larger part of the fetal surgical repertoire. So to treat a disease, you of course have to diagnose it. Fetal surgery evolved, as I mentioned with Dr. Harrison, as a result of prenatal ultrasound. When we started seeing anatomic problems before birth and some of the more common conditions are listed here. The diagnosing before birth at the very least allows you to prepare for the newborn. The parents meet with a relevant specialist, plan for delivery at a tertiary care center, uh, and for some medical therapies, coordinate insurance coverage if they're costly. And in some cases, fetal surgery may be offered. And this field has been transformative in the way that we think about some conditions like congenital diaphragmatic hernias or spina bifida. Well, we're living in the genomic age now. And as we start to do more genetic testing in addition to ultrasound, we're diagnosing genetic conditions that have ultrasound manifestations. And this allows us to expand the scope of fetal surgery to medical therapies. So our group has been fascinated by HYDROPS, which is the ultrasound findings that you see here of ascites, uh, which is fluid around the liver, pleural effusion, skin edema. And this is often fatal before birth if you don't treat the cause of the HYDROPS. But HYDROPS is the final common pathway for dozens of different conditions. And we now understand, and Dr. Sparks will cover this more in her talk, that many fetuses with HYDROPS actually have single gene disorders. The top two treatable conditions here are alpha thalassemia and some lysosomal storage diseases. And not surprisingly, they have been at the top of our list for starting new therapies. So we're now offering participation in a clinical trial of fetal therapy at UCSF for these conditions. So for alpha thalassemia, we have an ongoing phase one clinical trial of stem cell transplantation before birth. We have an IND to transplant maternal cells in fetuses with alpha thal major between 18 to 26 weeks. These fetuses already need a fetal blood transfusion to survive to birth, and we're giving maternal derived stem cells without any immune condition to take fetal components of the maternal cells during pregnancy. And we've transplanted five fetuses so far. We also just launched a clinical trial of in utero enzyme replacement therapy with lysosomal storage diseases. These patients can get recombinant enzyme replacement therapy after birth, usually every two to four weeks. So in this phase one trial, we will test the safety and efficacy of infusing that recombinant enzyme before birth, starting at diagnosis or just after eight we 18 weeks and continuing until just before birth. So we learned a lot from these experiences about the regulatory pathway of starting a fetal clinical trial. In both cases, 
these were products that were FDA approved in the postnatal setting. So for alpha thalassemia, we had decades of work um, in, um, in preclinical models and in human cases of stem cell transplantation. And for lysosomal storage diseases, we had a mouse study that showed efficacy and a very compelling case for doing something for fetus uh, in distress, as you just heard about from Hunter. Because lysosomal storage diseases are similar disorders with similar rationale for treatment and biomarkers, et cetera, we were able to put eight different lysosomal storage diseases under a single IND for this clinical trial. So what about genetic diseases that don't have an ultrasound finding? Well, we can diagnose those as well. For some severe and relatively common diseases, such as spinal muscular atrophy and cystic fibrosis, obstetricians recommend uh, carrier screening for all pregnancies. There's also CVS, amniocentesis, non-invasive testing, and even whole exome sequencing, as you'll hear more about later. In the near future, we could have better early prenatal genetic diagnosis, such as by expanded carrier screening for additional conditions or fetal screening for specific disorders for which there is a fetal therapy. So one important thing we've learned is that some patients choose not to have screening because it wouldn't change what they do with a pregnancy. But if there were a life-saving fetal therapy that could be offered, that of course could change the equation. So in the near future, there can be a scenario where we can diagnose these and other genetic conditions accurately in the prenatal period. So in terms of gene therapies, as you know, there's a lot of momentum now in treating single gene disorders in pediatric and adult patients. And these are some of the modalities we're talking about under the umbrella term of gene therapy. Stefan Sanders will talk more about this in the next session. Antisense oligos, gene replacement or gene editing, and of course the delivery vehicles, either viral or non-viral. So this is a, a slide from Fyodor Ernov at the Innovative Genomics Institute detailing the kinds of therapies and the disease indications. So antisense oligos, of course, target mRNA, so they need to be redosed, but do not carry the risk of insertional mutagenesis. Gene replacement with AAV vectors is in numerous clinical trials, but the AAV remains episomal, and there's concern that it can wash out during the period of organ development in the fetus. But there's also data that AAV can integrate in the fetus that we'll get into later. There are a lot of trials of gene therapy with lentiviral vectors. Most of these are ex vivo editing of hematopoietic stem cells, which is less relevant for prenatal use. And then we have the enormous family of gene editing reagents, such as CRISPR-Cas9 on other nucleases, which of course edit a precise location in the genome, but could have alterations and or concerns about heritability depending on the delivery vehicle. So these are some of the approved therapies in each class, as well as the numerous products in clinical trials. Um, it's a busy slide and it's busy because it makes an important point. Uh, some of these therapies that are currently FDA approved uh, could be relevant for prenatal therapy, and there are so many more in the pipeline or could be developed for conditions that are relevant for prenatal therapy. Here's another slide from Fyodor that illustrates the explosion in therapies in the pipeline, and at least some of these are in diseases that are severe or early onset enough to be relevant for fetal therapy. So imagine a world where the people from all these different fields work with each other so that we can combine this expertise to offer prenatal somatic cell gene therapy to fetuses with genetic con conditions. Um, that could be a world where many children with these conditions could be born healthy and stay healthy. So you might ask, why do this before birth? Why not wait until afterwards? Well, the short answer is that these therapies could work better. And this picture lists several advantages of the fetal environment from a review article by Bill Peranto, whom you'll hear from later. And so we'll walk through some of the key points here. So first, the fetal immune system is really uniquely wired for tolerance. Naive fetal T cells, uh, as you see in the cartoon here, are epigenetically programmed to become regulatory T cells, which suppress an immune response upon seeing an antigen instead of becoming effector T cells, which is what they start to do after, after birth. And in many models, uh, we've been able to achieve tolerance to allogeneic cells, and this is the point of the alpha, alpha thalassemia stem cell trial, or recombinant proteins. That's the point of the lysosomal storage disease trial. And since immune response to the transgene encoded protein can limit the efficacy of gene therapy, this could be a huge advantage. We also don't see an immune response to the capsid protein and AAV, not even in monkeys. 
you don't tolerize to a virus, but there's no memory response if you see it later. And you'll hear more about this from Dr. Grasa Almeida Parada. So patients could be redosed with the same vector if necessary. So second, uh, fetal stem cells could be more accessible. We can potentially access and edit fetal hematopoietic stem cells in the fetal liver before they go to hide out in the bone marrow. So this is a figure from well, one of Dr. Dave Stittleman's papers showing that lipid nanoparticles carrying a gene editor injected intravascularly into a fetus uh, could get into the liver and this in vivo gene therapy technique actually cured beta thalassemia in a mouse model. So imagine that the current HSC gene editing techniques are mostly ex vivo, which of course adds to the morbidity and cost of the procedure, but a direct in vivo approach could potentially change the field of HSC editing and possibly democratize the treatment of conditions like sickle cell disease all over the world. We can get into the brain before the blood brain barrier forms. We've shown this for enzyme replacement therapy and stem cell transplantation in the mouse model. This is a paper from my lab where we transplanted hematopoietic stem cells from a reporter mouse into a fetus. And eight weeks after birth, we could detect green cells, which are donor derived microglia. And I'm showing the cells here, but we also saw the recombinant enzyme get into the microglia before birth. And functionally, this dampened the brain inflammation in mice with MPS7. And this could be a huge advantage because neurologic di disorders are of course an important target of prenatal therapy. And finally, just to state the obvious, the fetus is small. Uh, we get widespread distribution of what we inject. This is a figure from that Stittleman lab lipid nanoparticle paper that's representative of what a lot of us in the field have seen of how broad a distribution, look at the fetal mouse is completely green um, that you get, you get uh, which is of course important for many of these diseases that affect multiple organs. And this is a cartoon also from Dave of fetal size around the gestational ages that would be relevant for prenatal gene therapy. So think of dosing a 500 gram fetus instead of a, a five kilo baby or a 50 kilogram adult. So vector manufacturing might become much less of a bottleneck and fetal therapy could therefore potentially have huge economic advantages, especially when you think about preventing a disease before it starts. So as a field, we've been working on prenatal gene therapy in various animal models for decades. As you'll hear in the scientific session, this works really well. I like to say, if you happen to be a fetal mouse with any number of single gene disorders, don't you worry, we've got you cured. But there are important immune advantages in terms of tolerance and the recombinant protein and lack of immune response to the capsid proteins. These studies have also shed light on some risks. Um, first, AAV vectors appear to integrate in the fetal environment. So this means there's less dilution of the vector. In some monkey studies have seen expression of clotting factors for several years after in utero therapy, but of course AAV integrates randomly. So there's a potential of insertional mutagenesis. Although in those studies, the uh, integration into oncogenic hotspots was not seen. And this would of course not be a risk for ASO therapy or with non-viral delivery methods. Second, we need to minimize maternal exposure to the virus and or the editing reagents. And remember that the dose would be weight-based for the fetus. So there would be a very small exposure to the mom if at all, but this of course needs to be monitored. We're absolutely against germline editing, as I mentioned. Uh, you'll hear data from Dr. Parada of a careful analysis of germline editing using a retroviral vector that showed minimal risk but of course, these studies need to be repeated for each specific therapeutic modality. And finally, there's a procedural risk to getting uh, the vector, the therapy into the fetus. Uh, fetal surgery is quite advanced and there are some amazing technical surgeons out there, but it's of course not as simple as placing an IV or doing an intrathecal injection. So the procedural risk and the risk of miscarriage or preterm delivery need to be discussed with the, with the families. So the most important question then becomes, how can we inch toward a clinical trial? What are the various considerations here? And, and the last part of the meeting is dedicated to addressing some of these questions. So for example, what would safety and efficacy monitoring look like? Fetal surgery is a unique field in that there are two patients, the mother and the fetus, and we need to make sure that we minimize any risk of maternal harm. Anna David will go more in depth in her lecture. Thankfully, the procedural part of any gene therapy is much less invasive for the mother than many of the fetal surgeries offered today that involve a general anesthesia, open hysterotomy, et cetera. We need to make sure we have good biomarkers for efficacy. 
and we need to monitor postnatally for any unanticipated events and create registries for enrolled patients. What are some of the ethical considerations? Alta Chara will cover more in her talk and will address this in the panels. Here are some of the pillars. Uh, first is non-directive counseling. Uh, so you have to discuss all the options for the pregnancy with the, with the parents. Some diseases are prevalent in certain ethnic populations, so cultural sensitivity is important. We're not trying to have a marginal correction for a fatal disease, so we need to enable a meaningful improvement in healthy outcomes. And patient and parent representation, both individuals and in patient advocacy groups, is really critical to the conversation. So along these lines, we've worked with some patient advocacy groups to survey parents of children with genetic conditions about how they feel about a new fetal therapy, because this is likely the most, uh, the population to uh, be diagnosed with a, with, a, uh, with a genetic condition in the prenatal period. So here's our survey of the parents and children uh, of um, lysosomal storage diseases. We reached 169 families by working with patient advocacy groups, such as the National MPS Society, to ask these questions. Well, this was for enzyme replacement therapy. You can see that the majority of parents would not end the future effect of pregnancy. The majority of parents said they would choose fetal enzyme replacement if it were an established therapy. And still more than half said they would participate in a phase one clinical trial. So no guarantee of success um, of fetal enzyme replacement therapy. And we're continuing these surveys for gene therapy as well. And is a really important part of the process. So when you're looking the parents in the eye and talking about a brand new therapy, it's important to be honest about the fact that for any new therapy, there's a component of known risks and really a component of you don't know what you don't know. And so there might be unknown risks, but that we'll take the journey together and deal with the unexpected events as a team. And lots of regulatory considerations, of course, I've listed some here. There needs to be a prospect of benefit even for a phase one trial. And importantly, this is not just for diseases that are lethal in utero. There's a lot of precedent in the fetal therapy field for treating diseases that are severe and debilitating after birth. Open fetal surgery for spina bifida really opened the door for this. And our clinical trial for lysosomal storage diseases also demonstrates that rationale for taking advantage of this really unique fetal period to improve outcomes. And the possibility of grouping related disorders under a single IND, again, what we did for enzyme replacement therapy to facilitate the regulatory process should be discussed. And we're all still learning um, and workshops like this, and uh, there was a, a, a related one last week, are an important steps in de defining the field. So here's part of our roadmap for, for future clinical trials and some of the important considerations. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for taking this journey together. Next, you're gonna hear from Dr. Stefan Sanders on relevant diseases and therapeutic modalities for prenatal therapy. Thank you. So I'd like to talk about um, the next topic, which is picking relevant diseases uh, and disorders for prenatal gene therapy. And this is a topic we've discussed a great deal um, in the Center of Maternal Fetal Precision Medicine. I'm going to start off um, with maybe an obvious statement that it needs to be a disorder where we have the tool set to do it. So I'm going to take a few slides to just talk about the tool sets currently available. Um, and this also is to provide some background for some of the other talks coming today. I'm going to concentrate on three different modalities of gene therapy. The first one on the left is an antisense oligonucleotide. This is something which can um, affect RNA and requires recurrent dosing um, approximately every three months, often into the spine, particularly if it's um, for a neurological disorder. To understand an antisense oligonucleotide, we need to see an image of DNA. So here's a very small section of DNA on the left. That of course gets transcribed into RNA, which is single-stranded. And here we can see an ASO. And an ASO is very simply a small region of um, modified um, RNA, except it's antisense, and so it binds to that RNA. And the chemical modification makes it very resistant to being destroyed, but also makes it bind very, very tightly. And the way these work is by targeting a very specific region of DNA, and then through that binding, interacting with it. And that interaction can achieve a number of different things. So here we see a gene in DNA with exons and introns um, going from left to right. 
Here's the enzyme pole two, which is transcribing the RNA coming off it. And here's the spliceosome, which is taking out the introns to make a mature mRNA, which will go on to make a protein. And so you can see here, the exons being joined together, the introns removed. The first thing that an ASO can do is to degrade the mRNA. It essentially marks the RNA for destruction. And this can be used if there's a gain of function, which needs to be removed. The second thing it can do is to change that pattern of splicing. So this can either cause an exon to be skipped. For example, if there's an exon which has a, a variant in it or a mutation which you want to avoid, you can skip that exon. Or it can cause that exon to be retained if that leads to some functional benefit in the resulting protein. And by clever manipulations, it can also be used to upregulate mRNA. So in many disorders which are loss of function, the underlying problem is not enough of a protein. And there's a variety of ways of upregulating it, either by degrading a regulator or by um, clever use of exon skipping. The next method we're going to talk about is gene replacement. This is ideally suited for loss of function, including complete loss of function of genes, and often results in a single dose, uh, effectively a single dose cure. Here's an example of a gene in the general population. We can see there's two copies, one from the mother, one from the father. There's a promoter which tells Pol2 where to bind, and there's a gene. For example, here's the gene SMN1. And SNN1 encodes a protein here, SMN1 again. In an individual um, with spinal muscular atrophy, they have two different variants, which leads to both copies being defective, resulting in no protein being produced. And so to treat this, gene therapy replaces that missing gene. It puts in a separate piece of DNA with its own promoter, its own copy of the gene, and then this takes over the role of producing that functional protein. And then the third modality we're going to talk about here is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And this is an example of being able to edit DNA. And I should mention, it's not the only way of doing this, but it's certainly the one which has received the most attention and most com commonly used in trials. So here's another example of a population variant. So here's, this is the gene which leads to a lysosomal storage disorder. And the same idea, we've got the maternal copy, the paternal copy, and there's the gene making the protein. We can then um, see in a patient's DNA that there's been a variant, in this case, both copies, resulting in no functional protein. This time, the gene therapy is via CRISPR. And so what is given is another section of DNA um, external to the uh, chromosomes. And this time, two different bits of RNA are created. The first one is the encoding a Cas9 protein, and the second one is making a guide RNA. The guide RNA essentially targets the region of DNA. It tells this where to go, and it will ideally only bind to a single place in the entire genome. And then that guide tells the Cas9 where to bind, which can then come along and form a break, which can then lead to repair. And so how this might be deployed, if we take that genetic variant, you could target the guide to it, the Cas9 could come along using the other copy to then effect the repair, and then this converts the patient's DNA back to the wild, light, wild type, normal, leading to protein. And with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, we've seen there the example of editing to restore function, which is ideally suited to both loss of function or, or potentially gain of function. Um, and that can also be used to break genes, which is another way of sorting out the gain of function issue. But modifications of this system can also be used to change the expression. And so, for example, if you've, got, if you've got one copy of a gene which is defective, you can use the Cas9 system to upregulate the other copy or downregulate the other copy, leading to an increase or a decrease in RNA. And so this one system, through various modifications, can target a wide, wide range of approaches. Now, in terms of actually delivering these, of course, with a gene therapy, there's often two parts to it. One of them is the package which is delivered, which is what we just talked about. The second one is how that package is delivered by a vector. With ASOs, this is relatively simple. It's generally just given on its own, um, and it essentially diffuses into the cells to, to have an effect. And because it is able to diffuse easily, that also means it's cleared from the system. And this is why recurrent dosing is needed. 
So ASOs in some ways are a sort of gene therapy light. It's non-permanent, but it still has the benefits of that very, very specific targeting. In contrast, gene replacement in the CRISPR-Cas9 system needs some form of vector to get them there. And broadly, there's three types which you're likely to hear about um, over the next talks and commonly in use. The first one is lentivirus. Um, and this is particularly used for gene replacement. I've not seen it used for CRISPR-Cas9. This integrates into the DNA. Now that can lead to a very, very permanent change. The risk there, of course, is where it integrates may lead to problems and there's a risk of cancer coming from that. Most commonly now is, is the adeno-associated virus or AAV. This leads to some DNA which is external to the chromosomes. It doesn't integrate but that can also mean that there's a washout effect over time. So it's not clear exactly how long the effects will last, but they're generally measured in years. And then over on the far right, we have non-viral vectors, for example, nanoparticles. And these can be used in a very, very similar way and have usually lead to episomal DNA, just like the AAV system. And when the gene therapy is taken, it's the combination of both the vector and what's inside it, which receives the approval. And so this is, um, we've seen this slide before from Theodore, but just to make the point that these are no longer sort of science fiction in the future, these are approaches which are being used in the clinic right now. In fact, many of them have already been approved and there's even more of them in clinical trials right now. So to ask that first question of, well, which disorders are amenable to um, therapy, right now, the answer looks like almost all single gene disorders. And that covers thousands of disorders and affects millions and millions of patients. What currently seems too difficult to tackle are things like trisomies, for example, Down syndrome, or very large CNVs where there's no single gene target. But in the future, that may well change. And so in thinking about the criteria for the relevant disease, the first question is, is it amenable? Is there a treatable approach towards this genetic disorder? In terms of thinking of the other criteria, the next questions come down really to thinking about the risks. And so we we'll start off here with a very, very simple equation to make us think about how to um, approach these. And we simply think of the benefit to the child over the risk to the child. When we talk about novel therapies, these are inherently going to carry um, known and unknown risks. And so we have to assume that the risk to the child is substantial. And so to balance that equation, that means the benefit to the child must be substantial as well. And so in terms of the logical consequences of that, firstly, the disorders we should be thinking about, especially in the sort of first wave, they need to be severe. And so for example, high mortality, spinal muscle atrophy is an example of that, or very high morbidity leading to severe consequences lifelong. This should also be predictable. Uh, we need to be able to work out exactly which child is going to um, end up with symptoms because it seems intolerable to treat a child who would actually not have needed it. And so this might mean a very, very clear genotype phenotype relationship or the presence of a biomarker which informs which child is going to have a severe outcome. And then the therapy should be effective. And there's really two obvious ways of demonstrating this. The first one is very, very strong data in animal systems. Um, the second one is postnatal therapy um, and then it being redeployed to prenatal therapy. And so that leads to our second box there of, the, of um, thinking about the criteria of there being therapeutic benefit. But as Tippi so eloquently pointed out, when we think about prenatal therapy, there's not just one patient, there's two. And so we actually need to modify our equation, the benefits of the fetus over the risk of the fetus and the risk to the mother. And while, of course, everything is going to be done to minimise that risk to the mother, it inherently will never be zero. And therefore, something else needs to change beyond that simple equation on the right. A simple answer would be that we could decrease the risk to the fetus, but right now that seems impractical. And so therefore, there needs to be increased benefit to the fetus to, to outweigh that risk to the mother. And that increased benefit can come from a number of different ways. Perhaps the most obvious one is prenatal lethality. So if the fetus was not going to survive, there's obviously substantial benefit in treatment. An example there being alpha thalassemia. Many disorders, especially neurological disorders, have prenatal onset. And it seems likely there's a limit to how much therapy can achieve if given postnatally. 
And even in spinal muscular atrophy, it's been illustrative to see just how early on it needs to be treated. And another example would be Angelman syndrome, where the, where the animal data supports prenatal therapy. Another possibility might be long-term benefit. Um, Haemophilia is a good example of this. Many patients go on to um, develop an immune response to the factor nine, which is given all the um, other factors. If you can dose that um, early on, that can lead to the immune system recognizing the protein and therefore preventing the immune response. Prenatal therapy can lead to more complete treatment. Uh, Tippi gave the example here of hematopoietic stem cells and the ability to treat more of them leading to a more complete cure. And then finally, we have the benefit of crossing the blood brain barrier. This is certainly work which is under progress to work exactly what that means and what age that means. But for neurodevelopmental disorders, this seems absolutely critical. And so this then adds a simple third box to our criteria. There needs to be additional benefit of prenatal over pre postnatal therapy. And then the final box is thinking about practical considerations. One very, very important one is there needs to be a method to identify the disorder in utero. And we're gonna hear more about this in the next talk from uh, Teresa Sparks. A number of routes this can occur through either routine pregnancy care, for example, ultrasound, through genetic screening, which is becoming more common with the adoption of NIPT, but that still is a very, very small number of genetic disorders right now. There can be inheritance patterns, for example, in haemophilia, it's relatively easy to predict because it tends to run in families. Carrier screening can identify recessive disorders. And then biomarkers, which right now is a, a very immature field, but it's the logic that there will be biomarkers which can extend our understanding it seems, seems to make a lot of sense given the number of proteins involved in development. And then two other practical considerations. Firstly, trying to um, identify therapies with a wide therapeutic index. Dosage is gonna be hard to estimate. It's gonna to need to come from animal studies and therefore having a wide therapeutic index makes it a safer approach. And finally, minimizing the risk of delivery. Ideally, a single um, dose being given or being given into a safe region of the fetus. And so that then rounds out these criteria. So just to go through them again, we need to pick a genetic disorder which is amenable, which at the moment means single gene disorders. There needs to be substantial therapeutic benefit to outweigh the risk to the mother um, and the risk to the fetus. And there needs to be a reason to do it prenatally. And then last, it needs to be practical, including identifying it, delivering it safely and picking therapies with a wide index. That completes the, um, the thoughts on which disorders are relevant. And I'd now like to hand over to my colleague at UCSF, UCSF Dr. Teresa Sparks. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Teresa Sparks, and I am a maternal fetal medicine specialist and a clinical geneticist at UCSF. And I'm thrilled today to be able to talk about our approach to prenatal genetic screening and diagnostic testing. So one thing that you'll see over the course of this talk that I'll give for the next few minutes is that we've come a huge way in terms of our ability to make a diagnosis in utero. Even just a decade ago, we were very focused still on large scale chromosomal abnormalities, and we've evolved significantly to be able to offer clinical testing for sing a whole variety of single gene disorders. Um, most recently that has really opened the door immensely in order for us to establish a diagnosis for families, um, either with a phenotypically normal fetus or with abnormalities that we see on imaging. And also this rapid evolution in our ability to offer testing for families has really opened the door for a lot of the emerging in utero therapies that we are talking about. And so to give some context, when patients come in with a pregnancy or consideration of a pregnancy, there are a variety of options that are available to them. Those include both screening options and diagnostic testing options. And so thinking through screening options that tell us whether a, an individual is at risk of passing on a genetic disease or whether a fetus is at higher risk of having a genetic disease, we talked to families about carrier screening, as Dr. McKenzie mentioned in her talk earlier. Um, and with carrier screening, this is standard of care to offer to all patients. There is some variety in terms of how much carrier screening patients undergo. Typically, we offer carrier screening during a pregnancy, but ideally, it would be offered 
prior to pregnancy. So that way patients and families have the opportunity to understand their genetic risk and make appropriate reproductive decisions. We also have the ability to assess the risk of a fetus having a genetic disease, such as Down syndrome, trisomy 18, and other more common um, genetic disorders. And those are accomplished with a variety of screening methods, such as integrated screening or cell-free fetal DNA screening, as was also mentioned earlier. Um, more genetic conditions are emerging in our ability to pick those up with cell-free fetal DNA, but that is very much emerging and we're beginning to understand the diagnostic yields of those additional genetic conditions. Another option that is available to families and individuals considering a pregnancy is pre-implantation genetic testing for those that go down the in vitro fertilization route. And with pre-implantation genetic testing, we can assess the risk for a fetus having a chromosomal abnormality such as Down syndrome, or we can test for inheritance of a known familial variant. And so those provide other options for families and individuals who are considering a pregnancy or who are already pregnant in order to assess risk of genetic disease. Diagnostic testing, on the other hand, gives us a more clear answer rather than that high risk versus low risk. It tells us more clearly whether there's a genetic abnormality that's present in a fetus. And so we have a variety of diagnostic tests that we can send in the prenatal setting that are listed at above here. Often when we're sending these tests, they're in the setting of an abnormality that we see on the ultrasound or on sometimes MRI, which we're beginning to use more often. Um, sometimes though, we are sending the standard testing, which includes karyotype or microarray with a structurally normal fetus in order to assess genetic risk because we know that prenatal imaging is not perfect and there are many genetic conditions that we don't have the ability to detect based purely on imaging. And so there's families that will want genetic testing for some additional information for that reason. And as alluded to with Dr. McKenzie's talk earlier, we've come a long way in terms of how we approach fetal diagnosis and therapy. As I had mentioned over the past couple of slides, we have seen a big change in terms of the genetic tests that we're able to offer to patients and families um, who come to us either with a phenotypically normal fetus or with an, a phenotypically abnormal fetus. And that has come from karyotype to microarray to now many options for next generation sequencing. And just to clarify, when we're talking about next generation sequencing, that encompasses many of the terms that you have heard and will hear over the course of the talks today, which are single gene testing, um, gene panels, exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing. And so it's a broad category of um, approach to assessing risk of single gene disorders. And so accordingly, because our ability to make a diagnosis has, Im has improved substantially, our approach to correction of any abnormalities has also changed. Um, and so we've come from, as Dr. McKenzie mentioned, an open fetal surgery approach to thinking through fetoscopic options, catheter-based interventions, and other minimally invasive interventions, and now discussions around um, very minimally invasive approaches, such as injection of therapies directly into the umbilical cord or the amniotic fluid. When we are thinking about the yield of prenatal genetic testing, when we apply a karyotype um, or microarray, typically we think that the diagnostic yield in those cases, sort of for all comers, is somewhere in the range of about nine to 19%. There was a landmark study published in 2012 um, that also demonstrated that in the setting of a fetal anomaly, there's an incremental yield for diagnosis of 6% using microarray over karyotype. But that still leaves many cases for which we don't have a genetic explanation for some of the differences that we see on ultrasound or MRI. And there have been some great papers, and I'll show a couple of examples of those over the next couple of slides that have come out over the last couple of years that have shown us what the yield is of even more expansive testing called exome sequencing. Um, and what we've learned with exome sequencing, this covers 
a, a look at the at the exome of the fetus. And so focusing on the the um, exons or the the neat genes that we know about in the exome of the fetus. And when we apply this broad test, we can see that for cases that are otherwise unexplained by the standard testing that we send in pregnancy, that this test can identify a genetic diagnosis in approximately eight to 20% of cases, depending a little bit on the population selected and the indication for the testing. And so, um, this slide here shows one of the studies that I had mentioned that has come out in the last couple of years, and I think is a nice illustration of what we are starting to learn about the relative yield of tests like exome sequencing for the testing indication. And so um, you can see here that hundreds of fetuses were sequenced and that there were relatively higher yields for certain categories. For example, cardiac, uh, fetuses with cardiac anomalies had a relatively higher yield of diagnosis for both cases that were live births, or for cases that were live births, excuse me. And then for cases with multiple anomalies, they had a relatively higher yield um, for cases that were live births, as well as those that demise. Um, and cases with skeletal disorders had a relatively higher yield. Overall, all comers included, 8.5% of cases were identified to have a diagnostic variant on exome sequencing, and another nearly 4% had a variant that was suspicious but didn't quite meet criteria for being disease-causing. Um, so certainly important yield above the standard testing that we're able to identify with exome sequencing. This study um, similarly came out in the same issue a couple of years ago that also provides very valuable data about, our, about the yield of exome sequencing by different types of fetal anomalies. You can see here also that hundreds of fetal anomalies were sequenced, and in this study they found about a 10% diagnostic yield for exome sequencing for those cases that were not explained by standard testing with karyotype or microarray with relatively higher yields among cases that had a central nervous system abnormality, a skeletal abnormality, lymphatic or effusion um, or high drops all fall into the same category. And then the authors also noted a higher yield for cases with multiple abnormalities seen on the ultrasound. And so on that note, as we are beginning to understand the relative yield of exome sequencing for different types of abnormalities that we see on prenatal imaging, one area that's of particular focus with our group is um, hydrops fetalis, um, if fetal effusions fall into that category. And essentially what that means is that there's abnormal fluid collections that we can see on the ultrasound in the abdomen, around the lungs, around the heart, or under the skin. And that tells us that something is evolving and often there is an underlying genetic diagnosis for these cases. And what we sought out to do is you know, we know that in probably a quarter or less of cases of high drops, we're able to establish a diagnosis with standard testing with karyotype or microarray. And we sought to apply exome sequencing to cases of high drops and fetal effusions that were unexplained in order to delve deeper and understand what single gene disorders might be causing um, those particular genetic, that, that manifestation of high drops. And so you can see here that we enrolled over 100 cases of high drops and sequenced all of those cases that again were not explained by standard testing. And we were able to find a genetic diagnosis in 29% of cases. And this really highlights that for high drops in particular, there's a high burden of single gene disorders. Interestingly, the largest proportion of cases occurred um, in the setting of rasopathies. Examples of those are Noonan syndrome, Costello syndrome, cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome, and then a whole variety of other genetic disorders were also diagnosed. As you can see here, there were inborn errors of metabolism, musculoskeletal disorders, lymphatic disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, and many others, again, highlighting the breadth of genetic diseases that underlie the same common manifestation of high drops. This slide provides examples of 
the specific genetic disorders that we identified. In the previous slide, we showed the categories of genetic diseases, and here we delve a little bit deeper to understand what are examples of specific diagnoses within each of those categories. Um, and so again, you can see that, for example, rasopathies, examples include Noonan syndrome and Costello syndrome. For the inborn errors of metabolism, we saw mucopolysaccharidosis type 7, we saw GM1 gangliosidosis and other types of inborn errors of metabolism. For anemias, we saw examples with dehydrated hereditary stomatocytosis, diamond black fan anemia, and the list goes on, again highlighting the point that the prenatal phenotype of fluid overload is the common endpoint of a large number of underlying single gene disorders, and we need to delve deeper in order to understand those. Other important points to make from this data are that with the exome sequencing that we performed for these cases, we identified many novel variants that had previously not been reported. Um, and this is largely, I think, stemming from the fact that we are beginning to sequence more and more fetuses over time. And so we're beginning to understand the specific variants that cause disease in fetuses. And then again, coming back to the point that the majority of these genetic diseases in a fetus do not currently have an available fetal therapy, but they provide um, opportunities for development of many of the novel ideas that we'll discuss over the course of today. One point that I want to make sure that I cover when we talk about prenatal diagnosis is prenatal phenotyping. Um, when we are talking about exome sequencing, genome sequencing, other methods of um, genomic analysis, one thing that's really important is to understand the phenotype or the features of the fetus that's in front of us, because it's important for the accurate interpretation and classification of variants that are identified with these technologies. Um, with prenatal phenotyping, we utilize information that we see from the prenatal ultrasound and from MRI in order to put together all of the features that we see put them into a constellation of findings and then accurately interpret the thousands of variants that come out from genomic sequencing. We standardly do ultrasound for all pregnancies and we're beginning to apply MRI much more commonly um, for pregnancies in particular with fetal anomalies. And ultrasound technology has improved substantially also so that way we're able to utilize ultrasound to identify anomalies in a much earlier point in the pregnancy than we previously were able to. One limitation or a couple limitations of prenatal phenotyping that I will mention are that ultrasound and MRI, as I had mentioned, have, have improved substantially. We're able to detect abnormalities so much easier than we previously were able to and much earlier in the pregnancy. However, there are still some phenotypes in fetuses that are markers of genetic diseases that we just can't at present identify in utero. And examples of those things include developmental delays. We aren't able to, we can detect structural abnormalities in the central nervous system, but we're not able to assess the developmental progress of a fetus or milestones. Other examples include things like seizures. Those are very difficult for us to identify in utero and go with many of the genetic diseases that are potentially amenable to some of the therapies. Some of the other things that we think about with prenatal phenotyping where we have room to learn more are emerging knowledge of how genetic diseases present in utero and their unique manifestations. So examples of that include, for example, we had talked earlier um, with the presentations about mucopolysaccharidosis type 7, and it is quite common that we see high drops present in utero in cases with mucopolysaccharidosis type 7, but that's a unique fetal manifestation of that disease and not something that we see after birth. There's other examples of cases where there are fetal contractures, abnormalities in fetal movement, other subtle features in how a fetus will present in utero that are manifestations that seem to be unique to the in utero environment for that genetic disease. And it's an area that we are constantly learning more about so that we make an accurate diagnosis in utero. And we understand some fetal diseases better than others, but our knowledge is rapidly improving. And so where we are now is we've learned, we've come so far, we understand so much more about all of these single gene disorders that can cause 
fetal disease, but there's still much more that we have to learn. There's some great ongoing studies that um, are using whole genome sequencing, functional studies, and other technologies to delve even deeper and understand other genetic aberrations that lead to fetal disease beyond those that we're able to detect with the testing modalities that I've discussed so far. And there's some really fascinating work on genotype phenotype correlations because that piece is very key for us to understand for this fetus that's in front of us based on the features that we see on the ultrasound and this particular genotype. This is what we might expect in terms of the outcomes and the prognosis for that particular fetus. And coming back, as you might have gathered, but just to emphasize this point, why is a prenatal diagnosis important? It's important for so many reasons. When we have a patient that comes in to see us, our job is to understand them as a unique individual <clears throat> and family in order to assess their personal beliefs and values. And then we can guide them toward the appropriate testing and diagnostic options. Those include focused counseling about how they might approach testing, what is important to them, what outcomes are important to them. We, once we are able to make a diagnosis, we can then individualize the management, both during the pregnancy and after the pregnancy for that family, um, specifically making decisions such as surveillance, fetal interventions, um, ultrasounds, imaging, other important decision points during the pregnancy. Those are all affected once we have a fetal diagnosis that we're able to make. Um, and then once we have a fetal diagnosis, we can also more accurately anticipate the postnatal needs of that fetus. So we're able to plan delivery at the appropriate institution, plan ahead for a, treatments that may be needed after birth and have a much better idea of the treatment plan after birth and enact that treatment plan rather than waiting weeks for a diagnosis after birth. And then most importantly, by achieving a prenatal diagnosis, we're able to go down the road of talking about many of these fascinating and promising in utero treatment approaches. Um, and without this expanding ability for us to make a diagnosis in utero, we wouldn't be able to open that door into those potential treatment approaches. Dr. Sanders covered the criteria and some of the considerations for in utero interventions um, beautifully in the last talk, but what I would add to our and emphasizes just some of the same points that Dr. Sanders had mentioned, which when we think through some of these single gene disorders and what conditions might be amenable to some of the interventions that we're considering, we want to focus our attention on diseases that are identifiable in utero, cases for which we understand the genotype phenotype relationship, diseases for which the postnatal outcomes would be meaningfully improved and similarly, where we think that there is additional benefit provided from in utero intervention. Of course, we want to make sure that there's an acceptable risk benefit profile, and then incredibly important to hear from patients and families in situations of a fetal genetic disease and hearing from them about what is important about these potential interventions, what the risks and benefits are from their point of view and what they would want with these interventions. Um, and then I thought I would highlight here, this, these are two trials that are um, up and running that are led by Dr. McKenzie that nicely tie in to some of the topics that we've talked about. Um, and so both of these are um, emerging in utero um, approaches to treatment. One is in utero stem cell transplantation, and one of them is in utero enzyme replacement therapy. And both of these are open for recruitment. And they focus on alpha thalassemia major and um, some of the inborn errors of metabolism that I had discussed earlier and are wonderful examples of how identification of these single gene disorders can then lead to investigation of potential treatments for those in utero in hopes of improving outcomes. And just to end in the last couple of minutes, I hope what you've gathered over the course of this talk is that we have an amazing ability and that's expanding every day to identify genetic disease in fetuses. There's more to learn certainly, but we've come a huge way. And there are some established fetal treatments that are available, such as intrauterine transfusions for fetal anemias and surgical correction of some fetal anomalies. Um, there are a 
a very large number of novel and emerging fetal therapies and technologies that Dr. Sanders discussed that are beyond the scope of what I'm able to include on this slide. Some examples are included here though. And what is fascinating and exciting to think about are now that we're able to detect so many fetal single gene disorders, that really opens the door for investigation about many other genetic diseases and fetuses, again, in hopes of earlier inter intervention to improve the outcomes for those cases. With that, I'll say thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions to follow this presentation, and I appreciate the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Teresa. All right, we're going to move on now to a panel discussion. We've got 10 minutes where we can answer questions. I'd like to start off by inviting everyone listening. If you have a question, please do post it in the Q&A. We'd love to hear your questions. Don't be shy. If, you, if there's something which you're not sure about, would like to ask, there'll be lots and lots of other people with the same questions. So please, please do use that. You'll see a button on the sort of bottom right marked Q&A. If you press that, you could, should be able to write your questions in there. I'd like to start the panel by just introducing or reintroducing those present. So we just heard these um, fantastic talks. Um, we'll start off with um, Billy Lian Oglu, who um, presented the patient stories. Um, and she's based at UCSF, as are all of us um, in this panel. We then had the overview of the field from Dr. Sippy McKenzie, and then heard um, about prenatal diagnosis from Dr. Teresa Sparks. And so thank you very much for those talks. I continue to learn something every time I hear you guys speak and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd like to kick off the panel by asking a question myself. Uh, and if no one puts anything in the Q&A, you may hear more questions from me. And Tippi, I was struck by the comparison you made between the sort of evolution of um, fetal surgery and then sort of moving on to in utero and molecular surgery. And I was wondering if you could talk about how the risks of those established um, techniques compare with um, the potential for IUGT in the future. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Stefan, for the question. I think we're lucky in this field in that the technical risks um, of the procedural risks of delivering an in utero gene therapy are far smaller than the sort of acceptable risk of fetal surgery for these anatomic conditions. So, um, so if you think about, for example, for an open fetal surgery that involves mom undergoing general anesthesia, um, opening up the abdomen to access the uterus, opening up the uterus to access the fetus and operating, operating on the fetus and then you know, closing everything. Uh, compare that to um, an, an in utero transfusion procedure, which is the access to the umbilical vein. It's basically a local anesthetic with some sedation and just a, a, a needle that goes through the mother's abdomen into, into the fetus. So, um, so clearly there are some procedural risks um, associated with that, and Dr. gonzalez Velas will uh, talk more about it in session three, um, but I think that the procedural risks are, are smaller than the accepted open fetal surgical risks. I think the really important things to consider, though, is that the First of all, the maternal risk, um, you know, you have the, the two patients in maternal fetal surgery, and we always say the number one priority is maternal, um, you know, priority to avoid is maternal risk, not the number two priority is maternal risk, and the number three priority is maternal risk. Um, so, you know, because as mothers, we want to kind of do everything we can for our children, even the unborn children. And so we definitely want to make sure that we are doing all of the necessary preclinical pre studies to really understand what are the medical risks to the mom of these um, you know, gene therapies? And so that involves looking at, you know, is the virus or the delivery vehicle going into the mother? Um, is there any you know, toxicity for LFTs? Is there any germline transduction, et cetera? And then another important risk to consider is the risk of preterm labor, right? So you, know, you can treat the disease, and this has been the Achilles heel of fetal surgery for all the other indications is, you can treat the disease, great, but then you end up with a preterm delivery and you have all the problems of prematurity on top of the original disease that you were trying to treat. So there's definitely a risk of preterm labor every time you do any kind of procedure. Again, it's a lower risk for these very minimally invasive procedures compared to open fetal surgery, but all of those are important to consider. So I think we'll have to have a separate math equation that you did um, <laughs> for some of these. <laughs> 
Thank you. I, I know I know everyone likes a good equation. Um, thanks, thanks, Tiffy. Um, we've had a question from um, Charlotte uh, Sumner, um, who asked the question: um, How do you define meaningful benefit? Um, which I think is, is is something we we have debated at length amongst ourselves, but I think it's it's a good one to discuss a bit more. Um, I, I, since it was something which is in, in my talk, I'll start off with my thought on that and. I, I was struck by the postnatal trial in spinal muscular atrophy, where you go from very, very, very substantial mortality to very, very, you know, almost complete survival and with, with good long term prospects. And just, you know, like, I think when it gets to that stage, it becomes very, very easy to see that that is a meaningful benefit. The, the challenge is when it gets less than that, you know, when it's when you're talking about maybe a small improvement in morbidity. And I, I think from a practical point of view, the early therapies um, used in this manner are going to need to be on that sort of end where it's just dramatic, where we don't really need to think about it too much. And that then ushers in as we become familiar with the risks and it becomes more routine, then, then maybe sort of meaningful gets smaller. But I, you know, I'd, I'd welcome my panellists' um, comments on that as well. I think that meaningful is something that we really have to involve the parent and family community on because as we heard Grace say during the interview, you know, she's familiar with the diagnosis of alpha thal. She has a child who's managed chronically, but a potential intervention that could mitigate the burden of the disease, um, you know, with good, you know, consideration of the data, something she emphasized also would be meaningful. And as I view through the chat, um, Mahmouda Khatun had talked about the cost of prenatal therapy and making it accessible to third world countries. And part of me considers also the impact of these chronic diseases where access to chronic management can be very limited. So while the cost is a huge consideration in the globe, in, around the globe, considering how a lifelong of management could be mitigated by a singular in utero intervention, um, particularly in low access parts of the world could be extremely meaningful. So we really have to involve all of those um, key players, the, the families, and then also the global community in considering um, these potential interventions and how they can impact um, the burden of disease. Thanks, Billy. Um, but Mark Zilk has asked a question about your um, experience with the in utero ERT and what were the main concerns um, posed by the regulators? And Tippy, I think that's a, a question to you. Sure. Yeah, I think the main concern was, um, you know, maternal safety, first of all, you know, is there going to be um, a risk of the recombinant enzyme getting into the mother? Is there going to be a risk of the mom having an allergic reaction to this, you know, recombinant version of the enzyme, which, you know, she should be making the, the moms, of course, are carriers for these uh, recessive disorders. Uh, and then the enzyme replacement therapy is kind of unique in that you have to do multiple fetal interventions. The half-life of the enzyme is only two to four weeks. So that, that requires multiple in utero inventions, uh, interventions to deliver the therapy. Um, thankfully, there's a precedent for that in the in utero transfusion field, where of course you, you give transfusions every three weeks because of the half-life of, of red blood cells. Uh, and so um, I think that a prenatal gene therapy would be a single shot. So, so in, in, from a procedural risk, it's, it's a lower risk, but of course, from a, there could be potential off-target effects, et cetera. And, and a question to Teresa. Um, how does the changing landscape of prenatal diagnostic testing affect the uh, sort of future landscape of, pre, of prenatal um, in utero gene therapy? Thank you, Dr. Sanders. That's a great question. Um, you know, what I would say is I think it's really exciting with where we've come and where we're going with our ability to make a diagnosis of a genetic disease in a fetus. And I think that's going to, we're going to learn so much more over the coming years to as exome and whole genome sequencing and other technologies are applied to fetuses. And we begin to understand the fetal variants that present with disease in utero. 
Um, so I think it's really exciting to think through how we're going to be able to learn and identify more single gene disorders in fetuses over the next few years. The other piece that I would add to is the, the phenotyping. And I think that we have a lot to learn still from the phenotyping for all of these cases. Um, and so I think that as over the next several years, as we apply more detailed um, genomic sequencing and we are imaging in much more detail with particularly a diagnosis in mind, we're really going to learn a huge amount about genotype phenotype correlations and how fetuses present with genetic disease in unique ways that are often different than we see after birth. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here, which I think I think also relates to uh, Mahmouda's question about um, sort of long-term costs. And so the, the question is to Tippy in, in talking to pharmaceutical companies about being allowed to use the enzyme replacement therapy in utero, how much of a barrier was it that there was sort of reticence to, to use it in a new way, which might create new risks? Um, and, and what needs to be done to overcome that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's, it's kind of at the crux of conversations with the FDA as well, you know, is the, to what extent is the data that you're uh, getting in the prenatal uh, environment, uh, the safety and efficacy data, how, how much does that affect the label of the drug? Um, the in utero enzyme replacement therapy trial, uh, we're using FDA approved drugs off label. Uh, and so they don't necessarily need to be provided by the drug company, although we've been in contact with every single company. Um, I think it's a different question if you're talking about using a product that's uh, right now in clinical testing, but not actually FDA approved. Uh, and I think it's um, uh, this is where we probably just need to develop some guidelines and, and expertise about how do we use that prenatally obtained information for the postnatal label, because the, the risks uh, in the prenatal environment also include some procedural risks. Some of these patients are sick and have underlying uh, diseases. And so there may be toxicities that are not anticipated and don't necessarily uh, are not necessarily relevant to the postnatal use of these products. Great, thank you. There's a question from Julia Brown about um, essentially sort of changing in, in our knowledge about genetics and whether there'll be uh, developmental disorders like autism in the future, which might be relevant and, and how phenotypes would impact that. Um, and I think this is, I think it captures a really important point that what we've, we've sort of shown here is kind of this snapshot of where we are now, where we're sort of coming down to, you know, there's maybe 10, 20 disorders, which seem like they're at sort of the vanguard of what can be done. Um, but when we still think about the total number of single gene disorders, you know, it's literally thousands and, and millions of people affected. Now, autism, I think, is I mean, very, very, very dear to my heart. It's my um, sort of my main research interest is in um, understanding autism, particularly through genetics. And, and the idea of that leading to therapies is, is something you know, I dream of, of occurring. Um, the challenge there, I think, is that the sort of at the moment genotype phenotype relationships in autism are not as clear as they are in other disorders and so the, there's certainly not a one-to-one -one relationship between having the variant and having the disorder which I think you know so right now I think the idea of in utero testing for autism is you know really really shouldn't be on the cards let alone therapy but when you think about some of the more severe comorbidities which often occur with autism, for example, severe developmental delay, epileptic encephalopathy, there you're in a much sort of safer era where there's very, very clear genotype phenotype relations. And so I think for those more complicated ones where genotype phenotype relationship is not so clear, personally, I think we're going to need biomarkers to be able to actually ever start talking about those in an in utero context, and also have a very, very clear idea about what the risks are and what the benefits would be. And to me, that seems a very, very long way away. Whereas global developmental delay and epileptic encephalopathy seem sort of quite high up on, on that list. There's a question from um, Jason Scher, and I think it's probably better to be our last one as we're approaching a break, um, about the question of whether AAV and lentivirus vector, if there's any evidence that they um, pass from the fetus um, onto the mother's side. Now, I, I know we're going to um, approach this in a bit more detail later, but I thought this is an important thing just to, to, to bring up now. And Tippi, I think this is probably in your wheelhouse. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm aware of uh, uh, several studies that have looked at this uh, in, the, in large animals. And although there's PCR positivity at you know, 24, 48 hours in, uh, after injection, uh, there is some sort of long lasting transduction of maternal tissues. And certainly uh, to my knowledge, no one's ever demonstrated after looking 
uh, any transduction of germline in, in the mother. So I think that, you know, for each modality that needs to be double checked, um, but um, it's really a tiny dose. If you think about the fetus being, you know, around 500 grams and the mom being at least 50 kilos, you're dosing at least two logs lower in the fetus than what would be a, a reasonable dose for the mom. Thank you. All right, I think we will draw the panel to the end. I'd like to um, end by thanking the panelists, um, Billy, Liana Glue, uh, Dr. Um, um, Teresa Sparks, and Dr. Tippy McKenzie, and we will have a 10 minute break and we're back at 8.40 Pacific time, which I think is 11.40 um, Eastern time. Thank you very much.